Amen. Thank you, Drew. I got to preach at Marable Hill Chapel last week. They are also without a pastor, and so they asked me if I would, um, would come preach. And I pray for them in the same way I'm going to pray for you. And, and what that video just talked about, that I pray that whatever pastor they get, and there's probably other churches in the city that are looking for pastors, and whatever pastor that your committee calls and that you all vote, I pray that they will bring somebody that loves this city that falls in love with South Arkansas, that might have some camouflage clothing. I don't know what it takes to fall in love with South, South Arkansas, but that they would come to Eldorado and say, God has called me to this city. That's one of the beautiful things about church planters is that God's not calling them to a church because the church doesn't exist. They're calling them to a people, to a city. And so I pray that God would bring you a pastor that loves the people of South Arkansas because I'm going to tell you, y'all are a little bit different. Uh, you're not like the Yankees from up north that I grew up with. You're all different. And so I'm going to pray that God brings you somebody that, that loves this city well. I'm going to give you the thesis of this message and then the one point that I'm trying to make right up front. And then hopefully we get there somehow through, um, through what we talk about from Hebrews chapter 1. The thesis is this. The idea is this. The theme is this. That God has used many ways throughout history to reveal himself to reveal himself to his own creation. But in the last days, um, he revealed himself through the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that he is the image of the invisible God, that he is the exact representation of the Father. And the Apostle John tells us in the first chapter that the Word was God. He was with God and he was God. And then the Word, what? Became flesh. And dwelt among us. And so we're talking about the Logos, the eternal Word of God, the big capital W Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that being in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And God's revelation was not complete until He revealed Himself in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So if you're a note taker, I'm going to make your job easier and give you the one point that I'm trying to make in this sermon, and it is this. You cannot live a Christian life while ignoring Jesus Christ. You can live a good life. You can be a good citizen. You can be a good neighbor. You can be good to your family. You can be a good member of the El Dorado community. You can be moral. You can have a good standard of, bibli- of, of business ethics, and you can do things right. But you can't live a Christian life while at the same time ignoring the things that Jesus said. It doesn't work out really well. In fact, there's very good evidence that the things that Jesus said is a very integral part of this thing that we call the church. Like the reason we're gathered here is because God showed up in the flesh, dwelt among us, and had some things to say. So you can live a good life, you can live a moral life, you can live an ethical life, without the teachings of Jesus Christ, but if you're going to live a Christian life, you can't do that and at the same time ignore the things that Jesus had to say. Paul warns Timothy to pay attention to his doctrine and his teaching, and he does so because in doing so, you will ensure the salvation of those who hear you. The writer of Hebrews here says, if this is true, that God is That Jesus is greater than the angels. This is a great passage, by the way, for you to memorize or show your Jehovah's Witness friends. If they show up at your door, just take them to Hebrews chapter 1. That Jesus isn't an angel. This writer says so. But if it's true that Jesus is better than the angels, if it's true that he was there in the beginning in the spoken creation, if it's true, here's what this writer says in chapter 2 that Drew just read. It says, we really, really need to pay attention to what's going on here. We should pay more closely, uh, we should pay attention more closely to the things that happen in regards to Jesus, his person, and his work than anything else. And so that's my point today is that you cannot live a Christian life while ignoring Christ. We must pay attention. Looking in verses one through three, I want to show you how I got there. In the first verse and the second verse, we see that God revealed himself in the past. That the author of Hebrews doesn't begin with the Christmas story in telling the story of Jesus. The author of Hebrews points to the fact that it was through Christ, through the eternal Son, that God spoke the world into existence. 
That Jesus isn't a story that starts with a manger and wise men and shepherds and angels and stars and all of the things that we think about at Christmas. Jesus' story is a story of an eternal son that was the agent of creation from all times past. That he was there at the very beginning, molding the world and speaking it into existence. The story of Jesus only makes sense in the greater context of the human story. It only makes sense in the context of Israel's narrative and God's redemption of the nation. That Paul's telling us that Jesus is the last Adam only makes sense if we associate it with the first Adam. That He is the true Israel, that He's the faithful Israel, that He's the true vine and the better temple. And everything that the author of Hebrews builds up only makes sense if we connect it with the Old Testament and the creation narrative. This author is stating from the very beginning that Jesus' story doesn't start with His ministry on earth, but starts because He was an eternal part of the triune God, forever past, forever future, that Jesus was always a part of that. There is a great resource written by a professor at Northern Seminary. Um, I think that's in Chicago. The, don't hate him because of that. He's just, that's where the seminary's at. And his name is Scott McKnight, Scott with one T. And he wrote a book called The King Jesus Gospel. And he really does a great job of showing you how the narrative of Israel and the storyline of Jesus fit so perfectly together. So there is, we are a part of an ancient faith. We're part of of a faith that we really need to understand in order to really grasp what Jesus was doing and what he was here to accomplish. uh, But here's what we're pointing to in the idea that Jesus is the center of the entire human story. He's the point of all scripture. He's the point of all creation. The universe was created by him, and I know this is going to break a lot of your hearts, but it was also created for him. All of creation was not for you. The earth and all of its wonderful majesty was not created for you. It was created for Him. We were called to be stewards of it. He placed us here to take care of creation, but it was not for you. It was created for Him, and that runs contrary to our ideas and our modern thought. In fact, the very first line of Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, not The Purpose Driven Church, but The Purpose Driven Life, the very first line, if anybody's ever read that, the very first words in there say it's not about you. And you, can, you might disagree with a lot of Rick Warren's things, but you can't disagree about that. It's not. Life is not about you. The Bible is not about you. The story of Jesus is not about you. Creation is not about you. It's all about Him. The entire book of Hebrews is one long exposition telling you that everything you've ever known about the Old Testament was pointing to something. Something greater than the temple, greater than the priesthoods, greater than the law, greater than the prophets. It was pointing you to the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Notice also that God speaks. Verse 1. God, after He spoke long ago. He's been speaking since the beginning of time. That He spoke the world into existence. That it reveals himself, Himself through speech. And the Bible regularly affirms that God speaks. And that His revelation is a means of grace. And we often only think of grace as this idea... Uh, that that comes with being saved, the salvific idea of grace. And absolutely, grace is no less than that. Unmerited favor that Jesus would, would give us His righteousness in place of our sinfulness. But don't you know that it's unmerited favor that you know anything at all about a triune, eternal God? The fact that you know that He's immutable? The fact that you know that He's all powerful? The fact that you know He exists in three persons but is one God, and even if you don't understand it, you know it to be true. The fact that He indwells you with the Holy Spirit. The fact that He is ever-present, omniscient, right? And He is all-knowing. The fact that you know that He loves you, and that He came for you, and that He died for you. The fact that you know any of these things is is a means of grace. I know more about the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ than I do about my next-door neighbor. Doesn't that boggle your mind? This eternal God has made himself known. Folks, don't let that go. That he's made himself known. He's revealed himself. He didn't have to and he did. He existed in eternity past without us. Created us and revealed himself to us. That's a means of grace. And he did that by speaking. These verses also tell us 
it points to the final revelation of God in Jesus Christ. This term, the radiance of God's glory, points us back to the Shekinah glory. And it builds a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look what the author does. He says, He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, and in these last days is speaking to us through the Son. And it connects the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's important as we begin to understand that Jesus has fulfilled the demands of the Old Testament and the prophets. That He didn't come to abolish it, but He came to fulfill it. That this is a continuation of God's first revelation of Himself into His last revelation of Himself. The Old Testament is not, or the, the author is not saying, rid yourself of the Old Testament. But what he's saying is the Old Testament builds a bridge to the New Testament. Again, he's determined to prove that Jesus' impact on humanity did not begin at the stable, but began at the, as the agent of creation. And the Shekinah glory idea that God is the, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory points us again back to the Old Testament. You remember when, when God would show up at the temple, there would be this manifestation, this physical manifestation of God's glory. When Solomon's temple was dedicated, that God kind of came down and He showed Himself to be the representation of God in this, this moment, this temple, this ceremony, the Shekinah glory. What the author of Hebrews is saying is that when Jesus showed up, He was the Shekinah glory of God. He was the radiance of God. He was in all of God's glory. He came to reveal Himself, the exact representation of the Father. Not a close representation, but the exact representation. And here's where I want to get to the point of this entire exercise. Now, Logan is a pretty good example of this. Uh, Logan's girlfriend, Riley Bass, was at our house last night, and we were watching a movie, and um, she actually said, she said, it is eerie how similar you are to each other. Because we both have a, a slight bent towards snark and sarcasm. <laughs> um, it's kind of a love language of ours. We love to be witty. We love to be sarcastic. That's kind of where we go. We both chew on our cheek the same way. We both have the exact same mannerisms. Um, we both look at, each other, look at other people with like this just dazed and confused look when we don't care what you're saying. So sorry if any of you have seen that. I do care. Um, it's just a look I have. But we both have the same mannerisms, and people have said, and when we go home to Illinois where we don't get to see people, and they're like, oh my gosh, he looks just like you did in high school. Like, yeah, I know. That's what he's going to look like when he's older. So, I mean, we look, we're similar. We're similar. We're in so many different ways. We are similar to each other. But technically speaking, he's only 50% mine. Right? I mean, that's how DNA works. He's 50% his mom. All the bad stuff is his mom. <laughs> But he's 50% me, he's 50% his mom. We are similar, but not the same. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. The math doesn't work, but it's what the Bible testifies to. And so there was a great big fight about this in the 4th century in 300-ish. By 325, they convened a council to come together um, to talk about the sameness of Jesus Christ and the Godhead. The reason we sang the song about, I believe, I believe in God the Father, I believe in Christ the Son, that's the Nicene Creed. That's something that's been spoken of since 325 A.D., where they decided, they got together, and they were fighting over one letter, one letter that changed everything. There was a guy that said um, that Jesus was a similar substance and the church fathers got together and said, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God was the same substance. So there's a couple of terms. Homo, same. We all know that word. Same substance. Homo usius. And then there was homoi. Homoi usius. And the, they were like, well, let's just go with homoi. He was kind of the same, but not exactly the same. And the church decided, no, that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that he's the exact representation of the Father. That he is exactly who God said he was. That Jesus himself said, I and the Father are one. So how are we going to get away from this? And so 
the Nicene Creed was written to exclaim that Jesus was very God of very God. Philippians goes on to testify that he, even though he existed in what? In the same form of God. Did not consider it was something to be grasped. Or the, old te- the King James says, be robbered, like something clung to and taken, but humbled himself in the form of servant. You know the rest of the passage. The point is that Jesus was the exact representation of God. He and the Father were one. I love the story in John 14. Jesus is getting ready to be taken, to go into Jerusalem and just just be taken. He's teaching his disciples. That whole last part of John is just pouring into the disciples. And we we talk about this a lot in funerals. He says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, right? Had I... Had it not been true, I would have told you. And I'm going to go away, and you're, you're not going to see me now, but I'm going to go away, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to return for you. The so, disciples have questions about this, right? This is somebody has been teaching them, and they've been following them for three years, and they're trying to figure out what exactly is Jesus saying. So Thomas, Thomas gets a bad rap, but Thomas is the only one that's willing to ask the question that everybody else is thinking. All right? So Thomas says, time out. We don't know where you're going. You won't tell us. How are we supposed to find you there? Huh? Legit question. Where are you going? Because if Kylie says, hey, I'll be gone, come find me, I'm going to need, I'm a tracker on my Live 360 app. I don't know where she's at. They didn't have that then, so Thomas wants to know, where are you going so we can find you? Because Jesus continues to go, and he doubts Thomas's faith, right? He continues to go on. And uh, Philip says, wait, I have a, I have a question. Here, here's what would solve the entire dilemma. If you would just show us the Father, that would be enough. Like, if you would prove to us that you know the Father. That's the, that's the insinuation of Philip's question. Like, we have liked you, we have followed you, we've seen some pre rad stuff. But if you could show us the Father, because no one's seen the Father, ever. If you could show us the Father, it would be a pretty good indication that you are the son. You are the son of man. You are the son of David. You are who you say you are. So Philip's got a good question. Just prove it. Prove it. How many of y'all been asked that? Prove it. Where's your evidence? Show us the Father. Listen to Jesus' response. Philip, how long have I been with you? Don't you know that if you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. Jesus himself is going on and on to prove to himself that he and the Father are not similar. They're not close. They're the exact same. And I want you to hear me. If you have this image that Jesus, his ministry and his mission on the earth was to protect us from an angry father who was standing there with lightning bolts ready to light us up. If that's your image, your image is wrong. If Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, if he is the image of the invisible God, if he and the Father are one, then your image of the Father must be filtered through the person and the work of who Jesus Christ was. Did he light people up? He loved people. He lifted the heads of prostitutes. He dined with sinners and tax collectors. And he said, I have come to do my father's work. My father is always working and just the same, I am always working. I only do what I see the father doing. Jesus' ministry on earth was an exact representation of the father's ministry on earth. That he came to seek and save those that were lost. Jesus came to love. He came to represent who the Father was. And here is what the author is doing. He's making a distinction that you cannot take, you cannot separate the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He says he's the exact representation of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, of who God is, his characteristics. He upholds all things by his power. And after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of the Father. You cannot separate who Jesus is from what he did. The person and the work of Jesus Christ. He is the God who made the earth. 
He is the God who made human beings. He is the God who made the demands. He is the God who made the law in order for humans to follow for abundant lives. He is also the God that enfleshed himself in human skin, that dwelt among us. The creator became the creation, and he also fulfilled the demands that he created, bore the sins and the unrighteousness of humanity in his own body. The person of Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, and the work of Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's work. Hear me. You can't separate those two. He only did what he saw the Father doing. He only did what was pleasing to the Father. And so if you think that God was up there saying, no, Jesus, I don't want you to save them. No, Jesus, I want to smite them. No, Jesus, I want to destroy them. Then when Jesus said he only does what he sees the Father's doing, he was lying. He represents the Father's nature. He's revealing to us a greater understanding of who the Father is. That God is love. And in him there is no darkness or deceit. So quickly, look at the doctrines that this guy lays out in three, three verses. If you could write tweets like this, it would be awesome. So he writes out in three verses that Jesus is the Son of God, the revelation of God's character and ethos. He is the fulfillment of God's Old Testament revelation, that he's the heir of all things, the agent of creation, the radiance of God's glory, the expression of God's nature, the preserv preserver of God's creation, the purifier of God's peeper, people, the mediator, and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. All in three verses. That's a lot to take in. Which finally gets me to my point. We're there. Note takers. For this reason, if he is all of those things, if he is all of those things, there's a big if there. Some of you might not believe that. Cool, that's on y'all. But if he is those things, we should pay attention to what he said. You can't ignore what he said and claim him to be all of those things. Like it doesn't go together. If Christianity is built on the fact that Jesus is the homo Usios, that he is the exact same representation, very God of very God. If Christianity is built on that, then what he said is of utmost importance. That's why Paul said, listen, you need to pay attention to that because in doing so, you will ensure the salvation of those who hear you. Now, is all, all scripture profitable for teaching and rebuke and, and, and understanding and exhortation? Absolutely. That's what this writer is going to say later on. But is it all the gospel? No. Pay attention to this. Whether or not you can explain the intricacies of the Trinity is not nearly as important on whether or not you can explain that Jesus was God. I don't know how he was God, but he was God and he died for me. There are some things that carry more weight. And we have to pay attention to those things. Dr. Al Mohler at Southern says it this way. He says, the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, these things, they're not the point. They were written to point us somewhere else. He says, they're like the moon. They are the lesser light in the, in the sky. They provide us with guidance to navigate through the pre-Christ night. But now the source of light has arrived and we can see clearly through his blaze. He's a better writer than me. That the law and the prophets, they were our guide. Paul says that they kept us custody, right? They were our caretakers until Christ arrived. And now that Christ has arrived, no one, no one goes outside in the middle of the day and says, man, I'm glad the moon is out to provide light. Do you? You might see the moon, but it's not giving you a source of light. You're saying, man, I'm glad it's a sunny day. I can see everything I need to do. Here's my point. You cannot live a Christian life while ignoring Jesus. And I hear, actually, I hear some of you saying, duh, duh. We got it. But hear me. Jesus says some tough stuff. Let's start with the easy ones. Love your enemies. Now, I know that there's a lot of people who say, well, Jesus really didn't mean what he said he did. I'm not willing to take that chance. I am much more banking on the fact that I might get to heaven someday and Jesus will have to tell me that he didn't mean what he said he meant. But I'm going to put my money and my time in the fact that maybe he actually meant what he said. 
And if I'm wrong about that, then so be it. But I'm going to trust the fact that if he said it, if God spoke it, we should listen to it. So there's an easy one. Love your enemies. How are you doing with that? Let's keep going since you got that one. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the left. Go learn what this means. Love mercy, or I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You cannot serve both God and money. He wasn't speaking to poor folks, he was speaking to church leaders. Church, you cannot serve both God and money. How about this? Don't worry about anything. Anything. You strain at gnats and swallow camels. You've neglected the weightier matters of the law. Deny yourself. Rejoice when you're persecuted. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Woe to you who laugh now. Whatever you have given unto the least of these, you've given unto me. And I obviously, I need to tread lightly here. And I need you to hear what I'm saying, not what you think I mean. But hear me. The Bible is not a member of the Trinity. The Bible is not an end in itself. The Bible points us to the end in itself. The Bible is a testimony about who God is. The Bible points us to Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Word, capital W, made flesh who dwelt among us and saved us from our sins. And don't just take my word for it. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself when He looks at the religious leaders and He says, you search the Scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But these are the very words that testify of me. See, the Bible points us to the word, capital W, made flesh, and you cannot separate who Jesus is from what he does, what he did. His message and the messenger must remain joined together. And so if Jesus is all those things that we discussed, the Son of God, the revelation of God's character, the fulfillment of God's Old Testament law and prophets, and the heir of all things, then what he has to say is of utmost importance. I'm reminded, and I'll close here some, at some point. Um, I don't get to preach very often, so y'all should have brought a snack. Um, but I'm reminded of the Mount of Transfiguration. Ah, what a great story. And, and, and here's, here's a couple important things in there. When Peter, James, John, they, Jesus invites them, like, hey, we're going to go up and talk to Dad. Whoa, okay, cool, right? We're going to go up and talk to Dad. When the Son of God says that, that's a big day. All right, And so they go, we're going to go up and talk to dad, and Jesus begins to glow. Second thing, if someone glows, listen, right? <laughs> listen, this person's glowing, that's different, it's not an everyday thing, listen. Peter changes his attitude, right? And there's a lot of life lessons in there, but Peter doesn't understand them yet, because he doesn't have this story to read about. But Peter says, hey man, this is cool, Jesus is over there talking to Elijah, and Moses, They're the, the law and the prophets, representing, we got the gospel, the law, and the prophets, equal weight, equal value, here's what we should do, we should build three temples, three tabernacles, three places to meet, we'll, we will have these great celebrations, we'll have ministry fairs, where we'll come up and, and we'll go in there and Moses will tell us everything that we've ever done wrong, right, it's going to be horrible, but you got to go through that to get, to get to Elijah. You go to Elijah, and man, and there's going to be all sorts of prophecies happening. It's like a Pentecostal revival in there. It's going to be great. And then you go to Jesus, and Jesus is going to love you, and he's going to heal people, and that line's going to be long. And that's just going to be a ministry fair week. That's where everybody's going to come for the hub of ministry. you got Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And if you know this story, I'm ad-libbing a lot of that. Uh, if you know this story, as Peter is thinking this and Peter's deciding, hey, and he shouts at Jesus like, hey, I got an idea. As soon as he says that, the earth shakes, a cloud covers, and they hit their faces, right? They hit their faces and God speaks. Remember what he says? He says, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen, I'm not saying don't listen to the law and the prophets. What I'm saying is they're the lesser light. I'm saying they're pointing to something greater. They're pointing to Jesus. I put a lot more weight in John 3.16 than I do in Genesis 6.15. Both spoken by God. And I know you're not 
probably don't memorize Genesis 6.15, but you can probably get close if you've been in church a while. Both declared by God. One by Jesus in the flesh, one by God the Father to Noah. What's John 3.16? Come on. Some of you went KJV on me, but that's okay, right? God so loved the world that he gave his son. Whoever believes in him shall what? Not perish, have eternal life. That's a, that's a verse that can save your soul. That's a verse that is salvific. It's a verse about salvation. Genesis 6.15 is about salvation too. But you know what's in regard to? Building a boat. He says, you shall make an ark of gopher wood, 300 cubits long. True? Yes. Spoken by God. Yes. But one of those verses will ensure your salvation. The other one will help you build a theme park in Kentucky. Right? And they're both about salvation. One was saving Noah and his family and ensuring the human race. The other one is about your neighbor and how he can be saved and brought into God's family. Listen, both are spoken by God, but one has equal, or does, they don't have equal weight. One is more important. The Bible is not a flat text giving equal weight to every verse. There are some things in the middle there that Jesus said that are of utmost importance. And y'all, you can't ignore those and live a Christian life. You can't say, well, I follow Moses, or I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos. Because Paul's going to smack you and say, we all follow Jesus. He is the authority in our life. So what are some things that you can do? First, an evaluation. Evaluate this message, evaluate yourself. Is what I'm saying true? Up for y'all to decide. If it's true that what he says has ultimate weight because he's the exact representation of the Father, then if that's true, then what he said and did is of utmost value. So secondly, humble yourself. Humble yourself. I know that that's hard for Americans. It's hard for American males especially. Humble yourself. None of us have lived out the ethic of Christ. So repent. Admit that. And move forward in an attitude of keeping with repentance. I am truly amazed at the lack of repentance in the American church. Repentance is a gift from God. Angels don't get to repent. We read about it. Like, they don't get to repent. They look at the gospel and they're confused. If you know your Bible history, if an angel sinned against God, what happened? Kicked out. Humans can sin against God, and what, what, would, what did God give them? The gift of repentance. I'm, I'm amazed by the lack of repentance in the American church. Excluding the gift of Christ himself and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I can think of no greater gift to humanity than the gift of repentance. We can repent. So do that. Just repent. Be humble and repent and say, I have not done this right. Thirdly, I would suggest reading the words of Jesus. There's a great argument in seminary on whether Jesus preached Paul's gospel. How dumb is that? Jesus preached the gospel. Paul preached Jesus' gospel. Read the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to be tempted to ignore most of it. You're going to be tempted to say, well, this seems impossible, Lord. It is. Yes. Does that mean you should not attempt to love your neighbor? No. If he said it, he meant what he said. And if he meant what he said, he probably thought a good idea for you to do it. You cannot live a Christian life while ignoring Jesus Christ. Marinate on the Gospels. Hear his good news proclaim. So let the Spirit lead you into truth. And perhaps I am in the minority here, and I'm okay with being in the minority, and it may make me a radical, but I happen to believe Jesus meant every single word he said. I believe when he lifted up the head of the prostitute and said, neither do I forgive you. I think he meant that. I believe when he said the Son of Man came to seek and save those that were lost. I think that was his mission. I think that when Jesus said that I can have life and life to the fullest, he meant that. And that I can receive the kingdom like a child. It's not complicated. 
I think he meant it. I think when Jesus asked me to love my neighbor and to love my enemy, and that that's how the world will know that I'm his disciples, is if we have love for one another, I think he meant exactly what he said. Man, I think when he said, who the Son sets free is free indeed, that I am free. I'm free from anybody else's opinion of me and how anyone has built my identity upon their misperceptions because I am free in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I believe when he said it is finished, he meant it is finished. That the work is done. The debt has been paid. That Jesus paid it all. I believe it with all of my heart. And I will go to the gates of heaven. And I will stand in front of him and say, I believed every word you said. I might not have done it perfectly. But I believed that you meant what you said when you said it. Because I believe that you could not live a Christian life while ignoring the things that Jesus said. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and your truth. And thank you more for the word made flesh that came to show us exactly who the Father was. That Jesus represented you, Father. That our understanding of you was so wrong. That you are a God that loves. That chases us. Enemies of God and you still chased us. That we had turned away from you and you sent Jesus to track us down. That you loved us, that you pursued us. That rather than attacking your enemies, when you had every right to do so, that you just laid on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that ethic is tough. But the fact of discipleship means that we have to do Tough things. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow in the ways of Jesus. And help me do that with every single thing you said, whether it makes sense or not. Crash into me today. Show me where I fail you. And I pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen.